Okay, so first thing we're gonna do is um, we're gonna go and download a 3D design file. So this is the steps I just showed you on the slide. Now, so we're gonna go to a website called thingiverse.com. So if there's a link there, now there's plenty of sites out there that you can get uh, files from, but go to thingiverse.com. Um, let's call this maybe one of the most popular. Um, I would treat thingiverse.com as kind of like the Android, the Google Play Store, um, in that it has a zillion apps, a zillion files on there, but you kind of need to be careful because some of them uh, are not necessarily well tested. You might get bad prints off of them. You also do need to be a little careful that there is a such thing as malicious G-code. So uh, those instructions can actually break your printer uh, or do bad things to your printer. You know, like somebody can give you a, a file that maybe looks really interesting and then what does it do? It, the very first thing it does is it takes your print head all the way up to the highest point on the Z-axis and it just drops it. Um, so I haven't had that happen. We print a lot of stuff, but just that's kind of a thing you might get some your bigger risk is probably failed prints. All right, so go to Thingiverse, and we're going to search, just put a thing that says boat up there for your search, because our goal here is to give you something small to print, so in the end, we actually have something printed. All right, and we're gonna look at a tool for designing your own thing here in a few minutes. All right, so search for boat, and your search results should come up and go and find this thing called bathtub boat. All right, now this is kind of a famous name, something called Benchy. So they're calling this Visual Benchy, but there's this uh, famous print. This isn't an identical version of it, but there's a print called Benchy uh, on Thingiverse. If you wanna go search for it later, you can. Um, and it's kind of like this famous print that prints this boat that actually has some uh, angles and stuff on it that make it kind of difficult to print. So it's a good way of testing your uh, printer to make sure you kind of have it dialed in. So it's called Benchy because it's a benchmark Get it? Um, all right, so go ahead and click download all files. And this should download a zip file to your machine. All right, and I'll actually go ahead and I'll do this. Thingiverse, boat. Here's my bathtub boat. Download all files. All right, so there's my bathtub boat. Everybody got it downloaded? All right, so now you should be able to, if you have it in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen here, you can just click on it. It should automatically extract it. Or if you don't have that, you can go to this little finder guy here. Click on that and then go to downloads and you should see the zip file in there. Double click on it and it should just extract it. So now you have a folder that says bathtub, uh, boat, visual, benchy, blah, blah, blah. Make sense? All right, so now let me make sure I do this the way Blade told us to do it. All right, so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna open up a program called Cura. All right, so this, the type of program we're opening here is something called a slicer, all right? And what a slicer is for you CS people, we think we talk about compilers that convert high-level languages to low-level languages. A slicer converts an STL file into the low-level G code. Um, so if an STL file is the high-level language description of a 3D object, G code is the uh, detailed process of telling your 3D printer what to do, okay? Um, so we're gonna go ahead and open up Cura, which is one of several slicers. It's probably one of the more popular professional ones. Uh, the other popular one is one called Slicer, S-L-I-C-R, but Prusa edition. So Prusa's made some adjustments to that. MakerBot also has their own slicer, but it's not open source. It, you know, it only works for their printers. But Cura or Slicer, your two popular ones. So we're gonna open up Cura here. And then let's see, do you have them dragging in? Oh, you guys are gonna have to create your new printer on here. So go ahead and keep following through the tutorial, but you're going to have to, see, notice I just opened mine up, and since you're the first user, you're, since you just logged in the machine, this is the first time you've used um, Cura on that machine, you're not gonna have any printers on here. So you're gonna have to click on Add Printer.
And then down here, you're gonna say you want a non-networked printer. And notice that it shows the Ultimaker series as the defaults because that's who makes this uh, um, thing. They're expensive printers. So we're gonna scroll down to where it says Creality. Oh, yeah, yeah, I can't scroll. All right, so there's Creality. And we're gonna choose Ender 5. Should be near the bottom. What's the Ender 5 Plus? Picture of the fat one. Is it Alicia? <laughs> I bet, is it just a larger? It's just the coming with the new Cura. I say it's a copy from... Oh, it's probably not released it, yet. Okay. It, it hasn't, it's very yeah. recent. So you want to choose Ender 5. I'm guessing Ender 5 Plus is the Ender 5 with a CR10 build plate. It's probably the 300 by 300 by 400. All right, so choose uh, Ender 5. All right, and then it should show you, it should auto-populate the settings and stuff in there for your, your build width and that kind of stuff. So 220 by 220 by 300. And notice it has some like start G code and end G code. Those things are all hard coded in there. That's like, what is the opening move for all Ender 5 uh, prints versus what's the closing move for all Ender 5 prints. That's the start G code stuff. So just leave all that alone and go ahead and hit next. All right, so everybody should now have a uh, Ender 5 printer as in the upper left-hand corner here. All right, so then we wanna choose our um, uh, filament. So make sure it says generic PLA and 0.4 millimeter nozzle. Most 3D printers come with the default 0.4 millimeter nozzle. So that's the hot end thing. So that's the size of the hole where the melted plastic is gonna squeeze out. All right. Um, a lot of printers will come with a smaller nozzle and they'll also come with larger nozzles you can swap out. So 0.4 millimeter nozzle is usually your standard and that's kind of the one that most people print with. Um, 0.8 will allow you to do things quicker. Now one interesting fact about 3D printing that um, I think it's very interesting, but it's a funny trade-off. Usually we would think that if you want something done at a higher quality, it's going to cost more, right? So with 3D printing, you actually use, the higher the quality you print at, the less plastic it uses. It's more efficient with the plastic, but what you're trading off is time. So for instance, right now, you if you will look at it, we'll go back down there, there was a giant uh, Star Wars helmet, Stormtrooper helmet that was printing. We had one print before that, that I printed like in the roughest way possible, like the lowest quality that I could just get a print off. And it printed in 12 hours, almost printed in 12 hours. Uh, it kind of failed at the end. We, had, we made it hollow and, you know, if you try to print stuff on top of nothing, it doesn't print well, okay? But in any case, it's 12 hours, but now we're printing it at like the super ultra highest quality. And it's gonna take seven days for the same STL file. Okay, because it is gonna use less plastic. All right, so that's your trade off. You'll use less plastic, you'll get a better final product. You just gotta wait for it. Make sense? All right, so, so make sure you select your generic PLA and your standard point two. All right, so we're gonna select open file here. You can do that or you can also just drag it in. So what I usually do when I'm using Cura, I'm just gonna cancel this since I already have an Ender 5 on here. So I'll just go to my Ender 5. Oh my gosh, why is my machine running so slow? So I'm gonna right click and clear my build plate because I have something on here from before. 
So I'll just right click and I'll say uh, clear build plate. And then I'll scroll down here to where my finder is and I'll double click on my bathtub thing. And then inside there you have a folder called files. And inside there you should have something that says simple boat. Just drag it in there, simple boat STL. So you can do it that way or you can hit open file and go and find your STL and get it in there. So when all is said and done, you should be looking at that. Okay, your boat sitting in the middle there. Okay, now I'll just show you this real quick. Um, while you know, So don't do what I'm gonna do because it'll take some time, although I'm concerned how much time it's gonna take on mine as slow as this seems to be running. Hmm, whatever. All right, so if I go and I just slice this right now, we'll see how long it's gonna take, but you're gonna see this, I'm guessing this thing's probably gonna take four four hours to print, something like that. Four hours and four minutes, okay? Promise you I hadn't done that ahead of time, okay? Just going off of experience doing these and printing a bunch of crap. All right, so we're gonna print something tonight, but we don't wanna wait four hours. All right, so we're gonna shrink this guy down a little bit. So what do we have a, a shrinking it to? Okay, um, let's see, he's adjusting some temperature stuff and material stuff on us, uh, 230 and 60. Okay, so before you do anything else, if you come over here to where it says standard quality point two, if this is in the tutorial, I'll just show it to you here. Hit the drop down there. Where's my custom? Oh, there we go. I already have it set to that. Is there a, a simple thing? Oh, here's recommended. Yours probably looks like this. Yours looks like this by default. I'm gonna click custom. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna scroll down to, um, I'm gonna make a couple of changes here. So. Notice here I have my infill set at zero. Your infill is probably 20 by default, which is fine. Um, so zero lets you print things that are hollow more quickly. Zero infill means don't put plastic inside of it, which means lighter, lighter quicker printing, and maybe it doesn't print. Um, but anyway, so I'll revert that back to, uh, I'm sure it's 20 is the default. All right, but we're gonna, what we really wanna do here is, is update the, um, the temperature. Because the default temperature for cure, I think it's like 240 or something, like 200 by 40 be, uh, bed. Yeah. So we're going to do a print temperature of, did you do 230 or 260? Uh, 230. Yeah. So you're going to do a print temperature of 230, which is what we print our PLA at. We usually do PET G at 60 or 260. So change your printing temperature to 230. Um, that should also change your printing temperature for initial layer to 230. So. All four of these first things should all be 230. And then the build plate temperature is set to 60. That's how hot the uh, build plate will get so that the filament will stick to it. Okay. So now we have our settings. You have Creality Ender 5 is your printer. The type of filament you're using is generic PLA. And you're using 0.4 millimeter nozzle, which is the default. And then you just made a small chiropractic adjustment to the standard quality setting to just change the default temperature that was set by the uh, um, generic PLA to print it a little hotter because we have found that it prints better on our machines at a little bit warmer temperature. Okay. So after you've done that, uh, are we turning supports on or off? Off. Off, okay. So... We'll go down to, so the idea of supports, if you uh, rotate this, any place you see red is a place where it might need support. So if you see it underneath it, that's not a problem because that's sitting right there on the print bed. But the idea is if you have something with a big overhang, um, if you don't put supports, uh, have it automatically generate supports, then when it's printing that, it's printing over air and it will just droop and fall and all that stuff. Generally, what you want to do is you would you want to try to print with as few of supports as possible. That's like the goal is print with few supports. Okay. Um, in this case, we don't need any supports, so we'll unclick supports. 
and then you printed with a brim, right? Yeah. Yep. So where's my supports thing? So make sure your generate supports is turned off. And then for build plate adhesion, I'm guessing we probably could have actually got away without a brim on this, but just in case. Um, so the idea here is, is if you have something that's very broad where a whole bunch of it is touching the, the build plate, you don't need to use any special build plate adhesion. Um, what I usually still recommend is you at least use a skirt. And what a skirt does is it just draws one or two lines around your print just to start getting the uh, filament coming out. Um, but a common thing to use is something called a brim. So a brim won't print anything underneath your model, but it'll give you some rings immediately around it to give you kind of more, a bigger footprint. So it maybe sticks to the bed a little bit better. The next level up from that is something called a raft. And what a raft does is it actually gives you a surface underneath it um, to, to print on top of. That's if you have a print where there's not a whole lot of flat surfaces touching the build plate. You know, let's say you were printing like a W, you know, you only have a couple of points touching it, even though the thing's relatively wide, you might want to print a raft underneath that so that your, um, the two points meld to the line underneath it. Make sense? All right, but we're going to choose a brim. Is that all the changes we're making for those settings? Looks like it. Okay, so now, because we want this thing to print quicker, make sure you select your boat. Just click it. And then over here on the left, we have a couple different things. We can rotate it, we can do different things. But this guy up here, it's called scale. Click that, make sure that you have uniform scaling clicked and change the 100 to 30. Now you've got a tiny boat. All right, and we're ready to slice now. Okay, so now we're gonna go ahead, we're gonna click slice. So this should give us something that takes roughly 20 minutes or something like that. And uses two grams of filament, which is two cents, roughly, with our $10 per spool of filament. Uh, okay, so that's a cheap boat, right? Okay, so once you have that, we're going to go ahead and save that file. So click save file and put it somewhere in the computer that you can find it here in a minute. Okay, so now we're going to go to our ticketing system. So if you click that link. So the way this is going to work, we do have an online way of printing directly to the printers that we're going to give some people access to. But in general, if you need to print something on one of our printers, what you'll do, really what you would probably do is you would give us the STL that you want printed and then say how big you want it and what kind of plastic you want and that kind of stuff. We'll give you kind of a template for it. But in this case, we're having you slice it for us since you know that we're targeting one of our um, brunt workers, one of the Ender Fives, so now you know the size of that device. So you could actually pre-slice it like you did and send us the G-code. Otherwise, we would expect you to send us the STL and we would slice it for you and blow it up in size or make it smaller. And if you told us you needed to be 16 inches wide by 16, whatever, well, we would then select the right printer that we have that can do that. We have a 20 by 20 by uh, 20 printer that can print pretty big stuff. All right, so once you're here, go ahead and click on submit a ticket. Click 3D print request. And then go ahead and put your name and email in there. And then he probably gave you a little message to, to type, I'm guessing. Yeah, so in this case, if you know you're printing on the under five, you can uh, go ahead and um, estimate, give us your print time since you're giving us the G-code. And then click choose file and go and find your G-code file and upload it.
see, we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. All right, so um, once you do that, we're gonna actually have Blade go and set your stuff up. He'll get it printing, but I'm gonna actually show you behind the curtain what's actually happening. Okay, so we actually have all our printers on a server. But it's behind a authentication wall. Okay, so here's all the Ender 5s that are on that wall. So uh, um, I'm going to go ahead and print on one. Yeah. Okay. So what Blade will do, so everybody has submitted their print job. Okay, so you should start getting their prints going. All right, so, but what he's going to do is what I'm about to do. So I'm going to go in here. So I'm going to just choose printer one. So notice here that none of these printers are currently working. We uh, purposely made sure people didn't use the printers. So I'm going to go to this printer number one here. And um, if this is, so this is the file that I'm not necessarily going to save on the machine. So you can choose to upload it uh, to our server. So it's available and you can go and... Uh, um, uh, print it multiple times, like if you had a part that you wanted to create a whole bunch of them or something like that. But in this case, I'm doing a one-off print, so I'm going to say direct print. I'm going to go and find my, uh, oh, hold on. I need to save my file. And we're going to just put it in downloads. So I just saved my boat. So here's my CE5 simple boat G-code. I'll double click on that. That's it. It's printing on printer number one down in the makerspace right now. So we have that set up. We used to have it running off Raspberry Pis. Um, and actually, so we can see here, the uh, hot end is at 24 degrees right now, but you should actually, the bed heats up first. So this is at 26. See it's going up. So this will go up to two, uh, this will go up to uh, 60. And then we'll see this go up to 260 and then it'll start moving. And then I'll show you something else that's behind the scenes. So these are the printers. So you can see all 12 printers on this uh, other server we have running. So we spent quite a bit of time, and I don't know if you've noticed that Blade and I have been down there for a few minutes. Um, we started off uh, 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 trying to run all these off of a Raspberry Pi. And you can actually run all of the printers off a of Raspberry Pi, that worked fine. Um, but then we tried to uh, have, because our our print server thing, this guy, he allows you to have webcams. So he supports webcams directly, which would be a little bit more convenient, right? If you were able to go directly into uh, um, uh, this guy and see the webcam for this printer. Um, but what was ending up happening is a webcam can do both audio and video. So it was taking up multiple USB system resources. So this is a operating systems concept now. So every single time you plug in a device, even though the USB protocol supports up to 128 devices, your operating system needs to support that many unique uh, things. And if you're starting to deal with I.O. devices with video and things like that, now it's going to only distribute them based on the number of buses and things like that you have and the ban total bandwidth. So bottom line is having 12 printers and 12 cameras all plugged into a single Raspberry Pi uh, that had these... Uh, you know, USB 3 powered hubs coming off of them, almost worked. We could have 12 printers, and I think we could have, what was it, four cameras, Blade? Uh, the power can have five. Oh, the, the yep. Raspberry Pi can have four. Four, okay, so we were running out of things. So what we had, we, you know, we experimented with this, so actually we now no longer have our server running off a of Raspberry Pi, now we have it running off of a $3,000 Linux box we had just laying around, thinking that was gonna solve the problem, right? Uh, it didn't, but we just left it on there now instead of Wi-Fi. Have it on a Raspberry Pi, but we had to repurpose the Raspberry Pis because the Raspberry Pi is now running our server over here. So we have, this is multiple Raspberry Pis all linked together to run all these cameras. Because each Raspberry Pi kind of bottoms out with a certain number of uh, cameras. So what we should see here in a second, this is the guy we're printing on up here. What we should see... It's at 143 right now. That should get up to 260, uh, 230 here pretty quick. And then we should see that guy start moving. Um, so the idea would be when you go to, if you were printing directly, or if I was sending something to the printer remotely, I would go to their camera and make sure a couple things. Now, if I go back out here to our screen, actually we'll start seeing this. So um, 
So notice here's my print going right here. Blade already has somebody else's print on uh, number two. Um, yeah, he's, he's just putting a second one up now so I can see these guys starting to print. But let's say that this guy right here is currently shows nothing's printing. And this is printer three. Well, I would come here first before I just sent something to that. And I would look at printer three and make sure there's not something just sitting on the print bed. The previous guy's print that finished sitting there just waiting for my print to go and mow it over. All right, so that's kind of the, the idea. Um, remember we talked about leveling the bed? So see how some of these things have uh, marks on them? That's when the nozzle gets too close to the glass surface. So both of these are running glass surfaces and uh, we've done a little etching <laughs> into the glass. It's all, you know, for, for whatever. Okay, so we almost at, so it's at 2.30 now. So if I go back in here, we should start seeing this dude move here in a second. So that's raising this thing up onto the Z-axis. One interesting thing about the Ender 5s, and we'll look at this when we go back down there, is the, um, uh, the Ender 5s, they have a um, fixed Z-axis on the printhead, and the bed goes down. Where other printers, the bed stays on the ground and moves back and forth, but the head goes up on the Z-axis. So kind of a couple of different approaches to it. All right, so then the last thing that we'll look at while he gets these things printing is we're going to go to a website. Did you give them the, the link for it? Tinkercad? No. Okay, that's fine. Yep, yep, that's fine. So you can use all sorts of different um, 3D modeling programs. Simplify 3D is a popular one, but it costs money and things like that. Now, most of you who had classes with me know that I'm not a designer. Okay, so I'm not going to create some sort of artistic model thing. So one of the things that I like to do when I'm solving problems is if it's not necessarily in my uh, talent area, I would like to get very, very, very good at a tool that I understand. So, for example, some people are like Photoshop whizzes, right? You know, they can do all sorts of crazy stuff with Photoshop. But if you look at Photoshop, Photoshop does about four million things. I know of what like seven of them do, right? So if I can become an expert of solving all my problems in terms of those seven things in my toolbox, I can do some pretty good stuff. Can't do the stuff Austin can do, right? But I can do good stuff with only those seven things in mind. All right? So just going to give you a quick crash course on Tinkercad. You probably used it in uh, one of your uh, classes. Um, but go to Tinkercad.com, and you should be able to sign in. Uh, I'm going to show you something that might be kind of beneficial for you just from a design perspective, um, and that's cutting holes out of things. All right, so once you graduate from Tinkercad and you want to start doing design in a more powerful tool, that's fine. But you're going to see we can do some pretty good stuff in Tinkercad. So I'm just going to create a new thing. Now, anything that looks like this uh, um, off gray stripey thing, that's a hole. So for instance, if I drag a cylinder out here and then I drag, well, actually here, what I'll do is I'm going to create this cylinder. I'll copy it and then just paste it. So now I have a second cylinder. I'm going to make this second cylinder a little bit bigger than the first cylinder. So I'm going to make it uh, 30 by 30. All right. So now I have a bigger cylinder. So I have one bigger cylinder. I have one smaller cylinder. I just copied them off each other. Now I want to cut this hole out of this cylinder. So I'm going to convert my smaller guy into a hole. So I just click on that and now he's a hole. And I want to do it right. I mean, if I, if I just drag this guy over here and just kind of, you know, Mr. Gonzalez style center it on there. And then I highlight these things. So I have both things highlighted. There's a little button up here that says group. If I click that, now I have a hole. So that cut a hole through that thing. 
So now you can make some interesting functional parts. But let's say I really wanted that to be centered. So what I can do is I can select both pieces. And we have a couple of different uh, things up here. One of them is called Align. So I can click on this Align button. And it lets me choose how I want these guys to be aligned. So I'm going to click this button here in the middle. And then I'm going to click this one here in the middle. And now it's perfectly centered inside of that thing. Okay. Again, it's not a real advanced tool. These are the couple of tricks that I know how to do with these things. So this allows you to solve some problems. Now, if I want to actually cut my hole, I'm going to go ahead and hit this group thing. And now I have my hole. All right, so what I'm gonna do real quick here is I'm gonna just build you something that I've previously built. So at my house, so I have a CPAP machine. So it's a thing for people with sleep apnea. And um, so I wear this mask at night. You're supposed to have like your mask, the, the tube thing hung up somewhere. So on my dresser, I have a little drawer that has a knob on it. So I wanted to go and I wanted to have a tube here like this that the tube could go through, but then I needed to have something coming off of that that would allow it to hang off of that little hanger thing. So I'll go ahead and I'll just drag a box out here. And uh, we'll go ahead and just make this guy uh, shorter, just cause. Oh, wrong short. All right, we'll say that's good enough. All right, so now I need that guy to hang off of the uh, um, my uh, little hole in my dresser. So let's assume I've measured that thing. I'll bring a cylinder hole off here. Uh, I can line it up if I want, but now I'll select these two objects, not the other cylinder. So I'll go ahead and group those. So now I cut a hole out of that guy. So this is going to be the part of my object that's going to hang off the little button, the little knob on my, my dresser. But now I need this guy to be attached to it here so that I can feed my tube through it. So I'll go ahead and I'm going to rotate this guy. Where's my rotation? So I'm gonna turn it this way. All right, then I'm gonna rotate it here and I'm gonna turn it this way. And we're gonna say that's perfect. Then I'm gonna drag it over here. I'm gonna lift it up just a little bit say whatever we're gonna say that looks perfect and now I can group all those things together I didn't actually have to do that if I didn't want but all right this is the little ghetto mr. Gonzalez rotation but it's close enough tube will go through that yeah it's a <laughs> so now I have my custom-made CPAP holder which is actually pretty close to what I actually made and I just export this guy as an STL. He, they usually give it a weird name, so I'll just say CPAP um, Proto 1. I'll go into Cura. I'll clear my build plate. Here's my CPAP Proto 1. There it is in there. Uh, I might need supports for the way that guy is right now. So, um, but let's just pretend like I don't. And I'll just hit slice. And I'm guessing that guy is going to take an hour. One hour and four minutes. What's the, what, what are we laughing at? Oh. Okay. So, I just, in front of your eyes, invented a top shelf 
CPAP custom holder for my exact dresser, because I obviously took my calipers and measured how big the knob was, right? Uh, I did at home, but in this case, I, I'm pretty sure this actually would work just fine. But, um, and now I, I would also have to measure how thick the tube is to make sure it would fit through, <laughs> through this, because you have to take the mask off of it, feed the tube through, then put the mask back on. Otherwise, you can't fit the whole mask to this little hole. But in any case, that's your custom widget. I had a problem at my house. I needed to solve that problem. I got decent at using this stupid tool. Um, did nothing fancy there. And I realized my final product isn't anything fancy, but it's something that's functional. And we saw this is nine, this is nine cents. Nine cents in plastic. To have a custom made CPAP mask holder you need. All right, so I would encourage you if you go through Tinkercad and you try to learn how to use it, um, and if you're really artistic and you've either already used Tinkercad or done the more advanced things with it, um, you know, I have found that the whole thing of cutting holes out of things is kind of the magic because now you can do all sorts of interesting things. Tinkercad also has some uh, built in. Um, stuff. So if you click on this drop down where it says basic shapes, you can go to, um, uh, let's see, you can click on connectors, for example, and there's all sorts of different like pre-built things for, um, you know, like ball sockets for locking things in. You can attach to your, your projects. There's also um, like screws. Yeah, so you can just kind of uh, flip through here. You can make your own numbers and stuff. Here, here's shape generators. These are good ones too. So, you know, if you want to create your own spring or you want to have a soft box or a bent pipe, bent pipes are good ones too. So you drag bent pipe out here. You know, because that would be something to model, that would be difficult to model on your own. And then you just start screwing around with the pipe width. All right, too big. And then, you know, you can change the bend angle to make it less bendy, so on and so forth. And then you can make yourself look awesome when you aren't, aren't as awesome. All right, so Tinkercad is a pretty powerful tool that is going to be more limiting than professional 3D modeling tools. But for making functional things, you can accomplish a lot with it. And you saw how easy it was just to build it. Follow that same thing about throwing it, the STL out there building your G-code, all sorts of stuff like that. Things that you get better at over time are going to be like, you know, if I kind of use this guy as an example and I look at this, see this is in red. If I try to print this as is, based on experience, it actually probably would work because this isn't so large that it's not gonna be able to bridge between these. So imagine as it's printing, it's gonna be able to print up this wall and not until it starts getting this overhang is it gonna become a problem. So a couple different things you can do here. You can say you wanna generate supports and just have it do it automatically. So this is gonna take one hour and four minutes with nine grams there. If I click on generate support and I just let it do its own magic I click slice. We're gonna see it's probably an hour and 25 minutes. Oh, 136. Uh, so that's 13 grams. That costs an extra four cents uh, to make that guy. All right, but I'll have pretty good supports. Now, one thing I might do though with my supports so notice it says supports everywhere and things like that. The default for support density is 20%. One thing we found is as you build bigger and bigger and bigger things, 20% becomes something that's pretty difficult to remove. It's basically part of the print. You have to get hammers out and things like that. So one thing I like to kind of experiment with is maybe taking the density down to maybe 1%. Like it doesn't have to be structural. It just has to be good enough to hold this stuff up for a very short period of time. All right. So you can also mess around with maybe rotating your model and things like that. But then I'm going to have a problem with I'll have supports inside of here. But those would be pretty easy to punch out. 
if I wanted to, you can also design your model in such a way that maybe it needs less supports. But with that 1% thing, I could probably get this down to an hour and 13 minutes. Big money. Ah, 128. Go ahead. In terms of traffic data, like say we made something you want to print them right away, is that still going to have to go through the layer that Initially. So here's the thing. So the idea is that for computer science students or people who take this seriously, that we can now trust with the server, um, that kind of stuff, you could probably print it right away. Um, or, since some of you have swipes, so to kind of be like earning the privilege. Some of you have swipes already. If you already know how to use the machines, you already know how to slice, you can slice it for the right machine, pick the right machine. I mean, we don't necessarily want you to have a zillion failed prints, but we have failed prints too, and you just get better with experience. You can walk up to any of the machines with an SD card and print right off your SD card. Um, then it would be possible for us to also add you an account on here where, you know, and teach you how to check the cameras and that kind of stuff. So all those things are in the... The, the wheelhouse once you started getting into printing and if you were using the resource seriously as something that, you know, that's what we want. We want serious hackers, serious makers. And if you become one of those, then we're gonna give you full reign. You know, you won't have to go through us, but we're gonna kind of, you've kind of earned that, that thing. Yeah. When it's slicing it? Yeah. So it's going through and it's looking at all of the uh, pieces of information in your uh, STL, so your 3D model taking into consideration all your settings you put over here. Uh, here, let me actually, well, all your settings you put over here, and then it is translating all of the little moves that your printhead's gonna have to make in order to generate that three-dimensional shape in plastic. Why so that's that, ultimately what G-code is. Well, you can preview it here. Well, here, the monitor will show you. This preview shows you what your uh, output is going to be. Yeah. And something is killing the battery life on my Mac. Yeah, so see here, this is all the infill we're going to have in there. This is the brim that I have around the thing. Um, so we might decide, you know, I might look at this and say, you know what? That is going to suck to get that out. That's probably going to be something I'm going to have to kind of drill through it. Um, and then, uh, or I tend to be pretty aggressive with these things. I might take a Dremel and then try to melt it, uh, or just melt it. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. So, but that's what it ultimately is doing. It's saying, here's all the little instructions that are, that are going to be required. All right. Other questions? Make sense? Let's see where our prints are. We should have a wall of prints currently going now. So all those machines, well, 11 of the machines are printing. Uh, mine is 71% done. So we have 15 minutes left for most of them. So why don't we go ahead and walk back down there. We'll kind of show you what the different printers we have are and um, I'll kind of point out some of the things like on the Prusa that makes it more expensive and that kind of stuff. And, We'll kind of talk about the actual equipment we have. Sound good?